Uh, so I'm here to talk about a system I wrote called Jones. Um, I, it started off as a, a code name. Uh, it's a street that I, uh, I used to go to school near. Uh, but I guess we forgot to come up with something better. Uh, I worked at uh, Dig, where we had a system very similar to this, um, built by a great guy named uh, Rich Schumacher. Uh, and then I worked at Discuss, uh, where I built Jones. Uh, so the problem um, we're trying to solve, and I think the problem every non-trivial app has, uh, is configuration. Uh, you want to be able to configure your app. Um, you want to be able to change these config values, hopefully without redeploying. Uh, and you want your app to be able to see these values as soon as they change. Um, Paul Hammond wrote an excellent presentation called uh, Always Ship Trunk. Uh, in it, he argues that web apps are not like ship software. You only have one user, you, so usually there's only a single copy of your code running at once, except when you're deploying, but that's a separate matter. Uh, and so branch management doesn't apply. It's not a viable way to control different features. Uh, in his presentation, Paul brings up a couple ideas. Uh, his first idea is separate feature launches from infrastructure launches. Uh, you can deploy the code for a feature long before you launch it, and no one will know. Uh, you can completely rewrite your infrastructure and keep the UI the same, and no one will know. So basically, decouple features from deploys. Uh, by the way, if I'm speaking too fast or you don't understand something, please feel free to uh, raise your hands and speak up, and I'll try my best to clarify or um, speak slow more slowly. Uh, he also had a second idea. Um, run multiple versions of your code at once. That way you can repeatedly switch between two backend systems and keep the UI the same, and no one will ever, ever know. Uh, or you can deploy a non-user facing change in only a small percentage of, of your servers, uh, and nobody will know. Flickr has a system like this. They call it Flickr Flipper. Flickr has implemented. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I, I, haven't, I don't think it's open source. I haven't been able to find it. Um, but this is what uh, their UI looks like. Um, you've got these features, you can turn them on and off, um, and in the client code, you can respond to the value of those features. Uh, and Jones, which is open source, enables uh, the ideas of Flipper and Always Ship Trunk. Uh, Jones gives you a way to make configuration changes uh, to your app in real time. It manages different types of environments, staging, production, development. I'm sure you've... Uh, I'm sure you've all got a situation similar to that. Uh, and it can also manage config on a host-by-host -host basis. Uh, but in order to understand how Jones works, we need to understand a little bit about Zookeeper first. Zookeeper is a centralized service for maintaining configuration information, naming, providing distributed synchronization, and providing group services. This is straight from uh, the horse's mouth. This is what, how Zookeeper describes, um, describes itself. And I'll do my best to sort of fill in what that means. So at its root, uh, Zookeeper is a uh, sort of a tree of uh, nodes, sort of like a file system. Uh, data uh, are called, uh, or data stored in what they call Z nodes, or just the, the vertices in the graph. Um, and in order to read from Zookeeper, you um, you address the Z nodes with a string representing the path uh, to the node you wish to access, um, just like a file system. So in this example, I'm not going to get too, too deep into how the, um, the code is working. We'll cover that later. But all you need to know is you just call zookeeper.get and then the path to your node. Um, it, it, it returns a, um, a two-tuple. We'll, we'll cover that later. But basically, we're, we're getting the, the data back, which is just uh, raw data. In this case, uh, it's a string. Uh, you can also list immediate children of a node. Um, so, for example, zookeeper.getchildren slash friends will give me the list of my friends. Uh, you can also optionally be notified if a, the value of a Z node ever changes. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to try to step through this code. Uh, it, it could be a little dense. Um, so again, when we're done with the code, if you don't understand, please raise your hand. Um, so what we're doing first is uh, setting up a callback, which is going to um, get the, the data of the node that changes, and um, something called stat. Um, KC is the name of our uh, Zookeeper client. 
So we can do um, essentially zookeeper.create. We're going to create a node under slash test uh, with the value foobar. And uh, the result is the path created slash test. And then we can call get slash test. And we can pass the callback in as a watch uh, name parameter. Um, and that returns the current value, which is foobar. And then if we ever set that value, if we set slash test to, say, baz, you can see the callback is invoked. It says, I changed, new value baz. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so when you're writing to ZooKeeper, um, there's a couple things you should know. Each Z node is versioned. So it's a monotonically incrementing number that changes every time you write to it. Uh, and this uh, lets ZooKeeper support something called MVCC, or multi-version concurrency control. Uh, if you've ever dealt with uh, CouchDB, you know what this is. Um, but essentially, it's a way of enforcing consistency. Make sure that multiple writers don't clobber each other. Um, so you need to understand the current version of an object before you change it, because that ensures that you understand the change that you're, um, you're invoking. Code. Um, this is, uh, this is very dense, so I'm going to go uh, over to the uh, projection screen and try to walk you through it. <coughs> uh, so again, Zookeeper, or ZK is our handle to Zookeeper. Um, we know what the config object is. Uh, stat we talked about briefly, um, but that holds metadata about the Z node. Uh, so we can access stat.version and say, what's, what's the version of this node? Um, <coughs> <clears throat> and it starts off at 1. So we can try updating the node. Again, we'll do zk.set, um, and we'll change the value to foobar. And we'll give it the, um, the version that we know it's at, stat.version. And it's a success. We can call git and look at the value, and it's foobar. Uh, we can also choose to ignore the version. We can pass in negative 1 to say, clobber anything. I don't care what's there. Uh, just put, get, put my data in. Uh, and that's required. You, you cannot update a node unless you pass in um, uh, the correct version or version negative one. Um, down here at the bottom is what happens if we pass a wrong version. Um, we'll set it with a version of 9,000, which is obviously not correct. Uh, and what happens is the, our, our Zookeeper client will raise an exception. It just it won't let it through. Is this big enough? Can you guys read? I will try. No, I cannot. Um, if, you, if you come uh, get me afterwards, um, I can show you. Um, also, my slides will be online. Uh, you can look at them there. Um, yes. So now, uh, hopefully, we all know a little bit about Zookeeper. How does Jones uh, use these primitives uh, to provide the system I mentioned? Uh, this is the main interface to Jones. Um, on the right uh, is the editor box, how you change the values. Um, so let's take a closer look at this. Um, config is stored as a JSON object. Um, you enter values here, and they're immediately reflected on the client. Um, and this uses a Jost to Jong's JSON editor, which is some open source uh, JavaScript editor I found, which is, work, works pretty well for the situation. Um, this section is uh, service. Um, service is a logical grouping of config values, um, and it's the highest level of granularity. Um, for example, your front end app, your back end app, different celery tasks maybe would be different services. Um, this area represents uh, something we call environments. Uh, that's, the con that's the development, staging, production thing uh, I talked about earlier. Uh, you know, you've, you've probably had production.conf, local.conf, staging.conf lying around somewhere. Um, and this, this lets you do exactly that with Jones. <clears throat> uh, so environments, like I said, are, are arranged in a, into a tree. Environments inherit from their parents, uh, and the actual config for that environment is shown in a, um, uh, a box called inherited view. Um, 
So let's see an example of what I mean, because that's, that's sort of a, a, lot to, uh, a lot to swallow. Uh, so over here is the, uh, I've got a big old arrow pointing to uh, the root environment. Sorry, that's very small. I hope you, hope you all can see that OK. Um, so uh, it's the root environment. If you look at the, the config box, uh, it says Q enabled equals true. Uh, and then if you look down in the left-hand corner at the inherited view, you sh it shows um, uh, Q-enabled true. Uh, this is the first child of root, which is slash production. Um, and it has a config called Q, and we're saying that our Q is going to be rabbit. Uh, and if you look down at the uh, inherited view, it says uh, there's Q equals uh, rabbit and Q-enabled equals true. Um, is that legible to anybody? No? Um, I'm, I'm going to try to change the resolution of that monitor. Um, this is probably going to end in disaster. Where should I go? Ah. Uh, Okay, is it better? Yeah. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, so I hope you're all still with me. <laughs> um, and then we can look at uh, the first ch child of the production environment, uh, which we're going to call new queue. You know, for example, we were swapping out our, our queue infrastructure, and we want to be able to test that our new queue works. Uh, so this new queue environment, which lives under production, says that the queue is, say, 0MQ. Um, and in the inherited box, or the uh, inherited view box, um, you see the value overrides the parent value. Uh, Q is 0MQ, and the Q enabled is true. Um, associations connect environments to physical hosts. Uh, and it can be any string you want, but it defaults to the fully qualified domain name of the host uh, that your app is running on. Uh, and by default, all hosts are associated with the root node. So going back to our previous example of uh, new queue, we're associating this config with uh, web one through three dot example dot com. So that means if you're if you look at uh, or if, if you if you go to one of these machines, uh, they should be using zero MQ rather than Rabbit. Here's, uh, here's an example of what the, uh, the Jones client code looks like that you would run in your app. Very straightforward. Uh, it inherits from a dict, so it acts like a dict. Uh, all you do is import and initialize it with uh, your Zookeeper client and uh, your service name, which is PyCon. And then we can index into it like a dict. Uh, the Jones, the locale is Canada. Uh, so going back to some use cases, um, configuration is really what Zookeeper was built for. Um, it's a good way to, say, define data sp database uh, slave membership, say you're adding or removing nodes. Um, you can do that in real time, and your, your app will, will see the, the new slaves. Uh, it can be a, uh, you can store a list of service entry, uh, endpoints. That way your app knows which host to talk to to get the foobar service. Uh, or to tune algorithms. Say you've got this complex machine learning algorithm, and uh, you've done some tests, and you've figured out some new values. Uh, you can update these in the app without actually sh pushing code. Um, and of course, switches. Um, here's, some, uh, the, here's how you would use Jones uh, for, for to enable switches, as talked about, and always ship trunk. Uh, so obviously, you can toggle features. Jones.get, it's a dictionary, so if it doesn't exist, it'll be none. Uh, do we uh, enable the flux capacitor? If so, flux capacitate. Um, we can enable features for a percentage of users. Uh, just give it a real number between 0 and 1, and check it against a call to random. And if so, um, do what you got to do. Uh, or you can, uh, you can do some sort of bucketing. Um, we're just basically dividing um, a user ID uh, into this number of buckets. 
and then uh, checking if uh, that user falls into a bucket that we've defined through Jones. So you can change it uh, during runtime. It's <clears throat> Other switches, um, switches, they let you commit f uh, features early. Um, you don't have to have perfect bug-free working code to get it out the door. Um, you can hide it behind a switch until it's ready. You can enable it for your office only. Uh, you can do public betas with it. You can say, we're going to give it to 100 people that we know or 100, 100 random people. Uh, or it, it lets you um, deal with graceful degradation. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, or tried to use Twitter during peak traffic, like the Super Bowl or the presidential election, but certain features just stop working after a while. Um, for example, uh, real time. <clears throat> so uh, if you were Twitter, you could use Jones to turn off these more expensive features um, when the load uh, became too high. Uh, and A-B a testing is another obvious example of this. Uh, so next, I'd like to talk about design. Like, how does, how does Jones use Zookeeper? Um, Jones was designed with three goals in mind. Um, clients must only talk to Zookeeper. Accessing configuration must be simple. I, we don't want to compute the inheritance per client. Uh, and unique views of the config must be available on a host-by-host -host basis. I, we want to be able to pull specific hosts out and give them very specific configuration. Uh, and we, the reason we uh, designed it this way is we wanted the clients to be as simple as possible to make porting clients easier. Um, but that means the server has to do all the work. Um, going back to um, this environment tree, uh, knowing what we know about the Zookeeper um, data model, it makes intuitive sense that environments would map directly to the Zenode graph. Um, each service has um, a root node containing um, environment config, associations, and uh, materialized views. Uh, I'll talk about what each of those mean. Uh, so this is, this is what it would look like if you were to print um, the tree. Um, you've got the, uh, the service name. Um, we use PyCon as a service example. Uh, and then under that are the, what I talked about, conf, node maps, views. Um, Looking under uh, slash service name slash conf, we can see it's, a, it's another tree. Um, the root environment is at the top, uh, and that just shows the, the queue enabled per the example we looked at. Under that production, uh, all it has to do is store queue equals rabbit, and so on and so forth. Um, and the node map node um, deals with these associations we talked about. It's basically uh, a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, your, your, your host name or your arbitrary string to uh, an absolute path to what we're calling the views, or the materialized views. Uh, and this is what the, uh, the views look like. <coughs> this is um, more, uh, more verbose than the, the conf, obviously, uh, because it has to inherit um, up, the, the children have to inherit up from the, uh, the parents. Uh, so you can see Q-enabled is propagated all the way down the tree. Does this make sense so far? Take that as a yes. Um, so the reason it's materialized into the single view is that that way we only have to do a single read on the client to get the data we need. Um, dramatically simplifies any client. Um, to, to give you a little bit of information about the server, it's just a simple Flask app. Um, it's got uh, support for some great software, so you can see how it's performing. Um, and it even allows you to um, set up some security so that you know nobody else is going to change these values but you. Um, and the client uh, is also very simple. We saw a brief example of it, uh, but all you need to do is uh, initialize the client with a service name, um, set those watches we talked about on both uh, the node maps uh, and the uh, environment view. Uh, the node maps watch makes sure we always know what environment is ours, and the view watch keeps the config up to date. It's very simple. So I, uh, I'd like to sort of finish up with a demo, uh, and I hope this works. Um, Okay. 
Oops. Uh, so this is going back to the interface uh, we were looking at earlier. Uh, I've created an example um, service just called Py PyCon example. Uh, it's got absolutely nothing in it. Uh, so we're going to add a um, just a, a simple value. We'll call it um, spelling. And the value will be, um, well, we'll just use a word like color. Uh, and we can update. And uh, then we can see the value uh, of what, uh, what the config would be down here. Uh, and let's look, at, uh, let's look at some code. OK. I'm going to cheat here a little bit. So um, what we did is uh, just do, uh, some basic imports. I'm going to make this much, much bigger. Uh, so just a couple imports. Um, Kazoo is the uh, Python client we're using. I'll talk about this later if I have time. Uh, this is the Jones client. Um, and then what you do is you start up your Zookeeper client and pass it into the Jones client uh, with the name of the service you want to access, the PyCon example. Uh, and then since it's a, um, a dictionary, we're just going to print out the value of it. And we get spelling is color. Uh, so let's go back to uh, the web app and add a child. And we'll call this Canada. Um, so if we, um, if we go back and take a look um, and just print out the dict, it's still, um, that is small. Oops. It's, still, uh, it's still the same. So we add, um, let's just rename it. Spelling is actually Kalur. <laughs> and uh, going back and checking it, it's still, it's still the, uh, the US spelling. Um, but if I associate it with my uh, machine name here under Canada, I'll add an association. Call it Gibson.local. That's my machine. Uh, I can go back to uh, the Python interpreter, try it again, and hopefully it works. Um, it's updated to the uh, correct spelling. OK. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, this is what you should have seen. We saw that. Okay, so I've got about 15 more minutes. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, go into a little bit more detail about um, uh, Kazoo, which is a Zookeeper client we looked at, because I think it's very powerful. It's very cool. Um, so to summarize Jones, uh, Jones doesn't really do very much, which makes it, I think, especially powerful. It just provides a hierarchy of configurations uh, with children inheriting from parents. Uh, and it gives you a web UI for managing uh, config as JSON objects. Um, and it gives you a way to peg certain configurations to uh, specific hosts, processes, clusters, what have you. Um, on the roadmap for it, you know, the UI needs a lot of help. I'm, I'm not very good at JavaScript, and uh, it might show if you start to use it. It works very well, it just it doesn't really show error messages, so the UI needs some love. Um, I hope to add um, ACLs so that you can compartmentalize services. So, for example, only the infrastructure team can manage the infrastructure service. Uh, I also want audit logs because I want to know um, if when my application breaks, it's because a bad config was added. Um, and I want the ability to um, peg to versions. Like, for example, this bit of code requires the version N of, uh, of this service. Um, see, see the GitHub issues for. Um, how uh, some other things we, we want to do. So right now, it's a golden age for Zookeeper and Python. Ben Banger uh, and company are diligently working on Kazoo, a pure Python Zookeeper client. Read PyPy support. 
Uh, it's very full-featured and well-written. Uh, and it ships with a bunch of patterns which um, support you know, some of the other use cases Ukeeper was built for. Uh, there's lock, party, partitioner, election, counter, and barrier, and we'll talk about what each of these mean. Uh, the lock serializes access to a shared resource. Uh, it looks just like uh, threading.lock, except you give it a path, which is this well-known, excuse me, this well-known location for where uh, your different clients are going to uh, coordinate. So uh, we're going to try to lock the MacGuffin. The second parameter is uh, an optional identifier, client identifier. For me, it's MW Hooker. Uh, and then it's a context manager, so with lock, we can use the MacGuffin. And that makes sure that any number of homogenous uh, nodes that know nothing about each other can make sure that only one person is using the MacGuffin at a time. Uh, party is another very powerful feature. Um, it determines uh, party membership. Uh, for example, who's currently providing service X? Um, if I could um, add this into, say, MySQL, for example, we could have a well-known location for identifying each of our uh, read slaves. Uh, and this is equally as simple. You construct a party object uh, with the well-known path of the party and optionally a client num uh, identifier. Uh, and then you join the party. And uh, if we list uh, the party, um, sadly, it's only me at the birthday party. Uh, partitioner is um, another very powerful use case. Um, this is a little more complex. Um, so again, please raise your hand if part of this doesn't make sense. But basically what we're doing is dividing um, a workload amongst um, any number of workers. So again, we've got these homogenous workers who don't know anything about each other, can all coordinate at a central location and make sure that only one of them is doing a specific piece of work at a time. So uh, we're going to partition a birthday cake into only three pieces. Um, and you've got you know these, these sort of these identical workers all trying to uh, obtain pieces of cake. So traditionally, in a, in a while loop, you would um, try to acquire um, a partition or a piece. Uh, and if it fails, then unfortunately, you don't get any cake. But if you've acquired it, then um, you can have any number of pieces, and then you have to eat all of them. Um, or if it's not acquired, then it's basically waiting to get a piece. You're in line. So then you just wait. Any questions about that one? Okay, uh, election uh, is another great one. Who's uh, the leader of a party? Um, what, who's going to perform this bit of work, or who's going to coordinate these, these workers? Uh, so again, homogenous workers um, all meet at a known location, election 2012. Um, my worker identifier is Obama-Biden, and um, we've got you know, n number of other people running for election. Uh, and when we call election.run, uh, Zookeeper is going to help us identify who, uh, who the leader is and then run uh, this callback function, which is the uh, swear in function. Counters, uh, I'm not really going to cover counters, basically a consistent way to, dis to add and decrement uh, in a distributed way. Um, this is very silly, and I think there are better tools for it. Um, uh, and barrier is the last uh, pattern I'm going to talk about. Um, what it does is it has um, your clients block until a condition is met. Um, so again, we've got uh, we've got this master process. Um, he, you know, the process is going to be using um, uh, coffee over IP, whatever that RFC is, to brew some coffee. So what it does is it it constructs this barrier at this well-known location. Uh, creates the barrier, and uh, from now on, anybody trying to um, get through the barrier is going to have to block. Uh, and then we wait while we brew some coffee, uh, and then once the coffee is done brewing, we'll remove the barrier. Uh, if we look at the bottom, um, this is uh, the the slaves, uh, the uh, the minions, the the, the coffee slaves. Um, they're all constructing this barrier at the uh, the well-known location, and then they're waiting for it to. Um, either not be there in the first place, or they're waiting for it to go down so they can have their have their caffeine. Okay, how are we doing on time? Um, I'm gonna talk for um, a couple more minutes, so we have a, a little time left for questions. 
uh, but I think I can get through this. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Zookeeper because um, Jones is great, but if you understand Zookeeper, um, a, a lot of possibilities open up for you. So before we only talked about um, data Zenodes, uh, Zenodes that hold you know, very tiny amounts of data. Uh, but there's two other types, and they can be mixed. There are ephemeral and sequence. Ephemeral nodes only exist as long as the creator maintains a connection to Zookeeper. Um, and this is how the party, the lock, and the barrier, rep barrier recipes are used. Um, so, for example, um, lock, you create an uh, ephemeral node at a well-known location, and um, other clients, excuse me, um, can try to um, overwrite that, um, but if it exists, um, you're not going to be able to, to overwrite it, so they'll, um, they'll block, and if the person holding the lock crashes, that lock will be removed, so you don't have this, um, this hanging lock condition. Um, sequent nodes, uh, sequence nodes are also pretty cool. Um, it appends a monotonically increasing counter to the end of a path. Uh, so if I create um, two nodes at slash lock dash um, and mark them as sequential, we'll get slash lock dash zero and slash lock dash one. Um, and the, the numbers are unique to the parent of the sequence nodes. Um, and this is how um, the, uh, excuse me, um, I, I believe y you've got these reentrant locks which uh, implement this. <coughs> Uh, so a major selling point of Zookeeper is that it's highly available. Uh, it's distributed. You, um, you get as many of them as you need, uh, and you put them in a cluster known as an ensemble. Um, I have to asterisk this, though, because it's not highly available if there's a uh, network partition, um, at least for one half of the network. Um, what happens when you write to Zookeeper um, the writes are committed to a majority of the servers in the ensemble. Uh, this is also known as a quorum of uh, nodes before the client is told that the write was successful. Uh, and that means since only um, a, ma a majority of the nodes have, a, um, have the current value, you might read from uh, a node with an old value and get, get the wrong data. Um, reads happen from any node, as I mentioned, but writes are all forwarded through the master. Um, and as ensemble size grows, read performance increases while write performance decreases. Um, and th uh, this, sh this shows when you, uh, when you understand that Zookeeper can only work uh, if a majority of servers are correct. Um, that is, with 2F uh, plus 1 servers, we can tolerate F failures. Um, one, this means we need an odd number of servers in the ensemble, and two, it means if uh, Three is the minimum we can run with, which can tolerate one failure. Uh, but if we have five, then we can tolerate two failures. Um, so there's some uh, references here on my slides if you'd like to uh, look at them later. Um, thank you very much for your patience. Um, I am looking for a job, so if uh, you want me to come implement Jones for you, uh, come, come talk to me afterwards. Uh, any questions? For a few questions, one or two. Go ahead. How about a question you? If you if you tell it all. Okay. Uh, one question you talked about the counter thing, and I I, I thought it was a good use case because I'm wondering, is that a way to build uh, like auto incrementing uh, values? You know, MongoDB does not have auto increment, for example. So is that a way we could use? to get an auto-increment, like, centralized without relying on some... Uh, what do you mean by auto... Oh, um... Having an, inc an incrementing value for a distributed network of databases, for example. Sure, um, that would be a, a great use case. Uh, the reason... Was that counter? Is that the example? counter, yes. The reason I don't think it's especially great is yeah. because okay. it, um, it requires that each client um, have exclusive access to the number. Um, as you increment it. So I have a theory, I haven't done this in practice, but I have a theory that if you get a lot of clients trying to increment the number, you're just gonna, you're gonna run into some problems and it's just you're gonna have clients blocking for a long time. Also, you need to set a retry, or, uh, a retry timeout on um, your calls to uh, add or subtract from the counter. So there's, a, there's in fact a very real chance that your, um, your modification of the counter might never succeed. 
Uh, that's because it has to wait until it can acquire the proper version number and then overwrite it with that version number. Okay. You said there was some other better solutions. What would that be? Uh, any SQL server, uh, Cassandra. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Break now, and there's coffee downstairs and snacks. Okay.